Hey everyone, welcome back to Crown Corner, the channel where we dive into the wild world of entitled people and their unbelievable stories. Hope you enjoy it. And without further ado, let's go. Law students in Canada have to complete a one-year apprenticeship before they're called to bar. The process is called articling. As the end of the articling year draws near, students always wonder whether the firm will keep them on or give them the hev-ho. This is how I got the hev. Huh. I saw my uncle at Christmas when we were over at his house for dinner. He asked how my articles were going. His horrid answer was not good, but I told him that things were okay. If you decide to stay on there, let me know the lay of the land. Maybe I can send some work there. My uncle was a VP in Giant Corps, a large institution embedded in Canada's financial system, and my uncle was in charge of adding or removing firms from the company's list of approved counsel. My uncle was the star of his side of the family, the one that had risen up high. His brothers, including my dad, had done well enough, but my financial institution uncle had really hit it out of the park career-wise. I didn't see my uncle all that much. Once or twice a year was about it, but he always interested in what I was up to, how I was doing. He'd offered to pave the way into downtown big law for me, that being a trivial task for him. All he had to do was drop a word into the ear of the managing partner of this firm or that, and I would be in. But me being me, I refused. I want to do this without any help, I said. And while my uncle understood my decision, he let me know that he was there to help. Over the next six months, I suffered in the strange hell that was my articling year. And as June approached, I sometimes asked myself what exactly had motivated me to refuse my uncle's help. Looking back, it was exactly the kind of help I needed. Other people in the firm had gotten their jobs through family influence, the junior lawyer that I worked for being a prime example. But I had been focused on doing it on my own, and that's probably how the firm saw me, as a young guy doing it on his own, without influence, a nobody. The month of May was torture for me, and then June came in with it, the end of my articles. At the beginning of June, it was time for a meeting with the partner who had been overseeing my articles. It was the exit interview, marking the end of my time at the firm. I should have listened to my uncle, I said to myself as I walked down the hall on my last trip to the corner office of the partner that was overseeing me. If I'd listened to my uncle, let him help me. Maybe I'd have landed at another firm, a firm that might have respected me. Instead, I was walking down a hall to an office where a man was waiting to fire me. The partner was supposed to be overseeing my articles, but he hadn't been overseeing me, not really. He only summoned me to his office when something went wrong and unsupervised me went wrong a lot because the partner had handed me over to a three-year junior for training. The junior had used me to do his legal research, write his legal argument and appear on his motions, taking credit for the things that went well and throwing me under the bus when things went wrong. Usually the partner yelled at me when I came to see him, his office windows rattling with the sound of his rage. But today he was all affability, for this was the last time he'd ever have to see me. It was the day of my exit interview, and the partner was going to tell me that my butt was going out the firm's front door, never to return. I suppose you know that you aren't being hired back, the partner said, not unkindly, after I closed the door behind me. I sat across from him and saw his face adopt a rather forced gee, that's too bad expression, which I appreciated because I could tell that he was trying really hard to be civil. I decided to act the same way at the exit interview. I knew going in that I'd be fired, and there was no point using the exit interview as a place to witch and whine about my year at the firm. I'd done enough of that in a partner's office. It was time to leave, and I was going to leave civilly like a grown-up. I kind of figured that out, I said. The partner had loads of reasons for firing me. At a court appearance, I'd cost them an important client by winning a case. A few times I deliberately effed over the junior that supervised me, and in the entire month of May, I handed in zero dockets. But I'd been able to cover my tracks on the big things that went wrong, including ruining the wedding of the partner's daughter, a truly sad tale that I will tell one day when I get the courage maybe after I've had a few drinks. It wasn't the big mistakes that got me fired. It was the little things that did me in, and one of those little things was that I had no friends in the firm. What did you like best about your time here? The partner said. He was reading from an exit interview form a bunch of pro forma questions to ask in boxes to tick, one of those thousands of forms that someone says must be filled out, but which no one ever reads. I was just glad of the opportunity, I said. That seemed to satisfy the partner. He scribbled an entry and moved down the form. Is there anything that the firm could have done better? He asked. Now he was stiff on guard because he was handing me the opportunity to complain about the firm, and he'd been hearing me complain since day one. Not really, I said. 
The partner smiled and ticked off the box, recording that the firm had done everything just great. No one at the firm knew anything about me, because during my year there I had not connected with anyone. For an entire year, I'd showed up at the office at 6.15, worked 12 to 14 hour days, six days a week, pumped out a ton of work, and gone to court almost every day. But in a big law firm, working hard simply isn't enough, not for most of us. If you want to stick around at a firm, you need to form real human connections with people. An introverted me was not the kind of person to form human connection. If I'd had an ally in the firm, someone to back me up, the firm would have found reasons to keep me on. But with no one in my corner, no friend to make note of the good things I did, my balanced ledger had only negative entries. What was the best thing about your experience here? The partner asked. That's a tough question, I said, and it was. My articling year took a wrong turn starting on day one, and the unpleasantness had never let up, not for a minute. I resisted the temptation to give him a smart but answer, because it would have been really easy to say that I'd enjoyed watching my junior lawyer boss publicly take credit for my work at a meeting, just before he hit the links or headed out to the squash club. I might have said that I loved being deprived of a secretary for half my articles because the office manager was mad at me. And maybe a sarcastic answer might have slipped out, but then my brain fastened onto the one truly happy memory I had of my articles, the one thing for which I was truly grateful. You know why I picked you guys to article at? The partner adopted a polite little smile and shook his head. No, as if he cared. Every other downtown firm I interviewed, all they wanted to talk about was my uncle. But you guys never mentioned my uncle. Your uncle, the partner said. Yeah, my uncle at Giant Corp. Giant Corp's not exactly in my wheelhouse, the partner said. The partner's clients were all big, but not financial institution big. Yeah. The other big firms I applied to, they all made a big fuss asking me if I was related to him because they recognized the last name right away. My surname is rare and unusual. In the larger world, the world of normal people, my uncle was just some guy that nobody ever heard of, but in certain subsets of the financial sector. My surname was instantly recognizable, and when I'd been applying for articling positions at the big law firms, my surname always attracted questions. But you guys didn't do that, I continued. And I really respected that. I appreciated that you were hiring me just for me, like my uncle didn't even exist. Really? What's his name? I gave him my uncle's first name. He had to write it down because his first name was as rare and as unusual as her surname. What does your uncle do? This was just idle chit-chat. The partner still being civil before he gave me the heave-ho. He's the executive vice president, I said. The partner's mask of civility slipped, and for the first time that morning I saw his genuine unmasked expressions. I saw flashes of puzzlement, of irritation. I felt his gaze wash over me, taking into account my $149 suit and the cheap tie. That's very interesting, he said, in a tone that said otherwise. Let me make a quick call, and while I sat there, he dialed an extension, leaving the phone on speaker. A woman answered, and he spoke the name of the firm's managing partner. There was a pause, and then I heard a man's voice ask the partner what was up. Yeah, so today's the exit day for one of our students, called in the 90s, he said. Say that again, the man said, his voice sounding clipped, urgent. Today's the exit interview for... Say his name again, his name, managing partner said. Call in the 90s, I called out helpfully. What, is he in your office on speakerphone? The managing partner said, pick up right now. The tone verged on the peremptory. I hadn't heard anyone speak to the partner that way, ever. But the partner picked up, and I could no longer make out what was being said on the other end. I could only hear the tone, and what I heard sounded like an angry inquiry. Yes, he says he's his uncle, the partner said. He for sure is my uncle. I was at his house last Christmas. I heard another loud question, and then the partner repeated my answer into the phone. I heard more questions, louder now, the tone angry, imperative. The guy the partner was speaking to went on for a while, and then there was a loud click as he hung up. Your uncle's a pretty important guy, so I hear, the partner said. He was still forcing a mask of politeness onto his face, but underneath was something else, an expression I'd never seen before. It was an expression of fear. The firm had no idea who my uncle was when you guys interviewed me, right? The partner hemmed and hawed and bullcrap, but his pen was still on his desk, and the exit interview form was forgotten. Hey, I appreciate you doing this exit interview and all that, but I have a lunch date, so I'm going to need to wrap this up. A lunch date with Angela. We'd started dating the previous December, and my lunch with her mattered more than the exit interview. No one ever said this was an exit interview, 
the partner said. No one except the partner at the start of the interview 15 minutes earlier. I pointed this out to him. That's in the past, he said, all forced affability. You might have a future at this firm. I might have a future at the firm. I repeated the phrase back to him, parroting it, parsing it, letting each word bounce around inside my head. Of course, the partner said, and I asked him what that actually meant. He laid it out for me. They'd hire me back. Move me to the department that serviced the subsection of the financial sector that my uncle's company occupied. I asked what kind of starting salary, and he told me, but I don't think I can manage without a secretary, I said, and I'm tired of having to type and bind everything myself. The partner assured me that as a junior lawyer, I would never have to do that. I'd be treated just like any other associate. So what did you mean when you said that I might have a future at the firm? What's the contingency? What's the reservation? The partner gave me some more hemming and hawing, but I interrupted him. I interrupted the partner that I'd been reporting to for the last year. The firm knows how hard I work, I said, pointing out that in addition to my own work, I'd done a big chunk of the work of the junior who was supposed to be showing the ropes. There's never been an issue with your work ethic, he admitted, and I was glad to see how readily he admitted this. That made me feel good. Okay, and how about my results? I reminded him that I was the only articling student in the firm that already had a case in the DLRs. Sure, I lost a few motions here and there, but it was my wins that had caused more trouble for the firm than my losses. The partner had to admit that my results were excellent, way above average. Yet the partner was saying that I might have a future, and it was that one little word that my mind was stuck on, might. But suppose my uncle doesn't send any work to the firm. Suppose he doesn't want to add you guys to giant corpse list. Sure, I got along fine with my uncle, but I had zero influence on him. He was just a relative that I saw once or twice a year. I could not ask my uncle to send my law firm work. We didn't have the sort of relationship. The partner said more words, made assurances, talked about opportunities, things that could be done, but I heard none of those words. The talk of benefits and an office of my own, of the partners I'd work with and the files that I'd be assigned, all that slipped by. Because after I heard that I might have a future at the firm, my brain stopped processing all the rest and focused on the unspoken contingency, the condition that the offer included by implication. I don't want a future that hangs on whether my uncle likes me or not and sends me work or not, I said. I see him a couple of times a year, and I don't want to talk shop with him. You wouldn't have to do that, the partner said. The managing partner is part of the unit you're going to, and he is great at schmoozing. All you need to do is make the introduction to your uncle, and the firm will take care out the rest. I'll think about that, I said. Do you have another offer? Because we'll match it. The other offer doesn't have any mites and maybes in it, I said. I had no other offer. But I did have an acceptance because Angela had said yes and we already had set a wedding date. The partner wanted to keep talking, but now it was me making polite noises, little sounds of affirmation as I made my excuses and headed out for lunch with my fiancé. I left his office and walked down the hall back to the area where the students all worked out of their crappy cubicles. It was close to lunchtime and the place was empty, but for one other student dictating away a few cubicles down from me. I reached my desk and started to pick up my personal effects and put them in my briefcase. My phone rang, but I ignored it and continued packing. The phone at another student's desk started to ring, and then another. I was just snapping my briefcase shut when the phone rang at the desk of the only other articling student who hadn't left early for lunch. I heard her pick up the phone, sounding bored and tense and bugged all at the same time. But then her tone changed. Called in the 90s, she whispered to me, with her hand held over the headset, it's the managing partner. What does he want to talk about? My briefcase was in my hand, and I headed for the elevator. Cold in the 90s, the student said again, louder this time, when I pushed the down button on the elevator. She looked at me like I was nuts, but when she saw that I would not take the phone, she relayed my question to the managing partner, as if she were my secretary, and the managing partner was just some guy trying to take up my time. He wants to speak to you about the offer. I pushed the down button, and while I waited for the elevator, I stared out into space considering the offer that I'd heard from the partner's lips a few minutes before, and which the managing partner wanted to repeat to me, maybe even amplify. I thought about that offer and what it promised. I also thought about the promises the firm had made already. They promised me a lot of things, and they had broken those promises. The firm had spent a year beating the psychological crap out of me, and the thought of spending another minute inside their walls was simply too painful. The elevator dinged, and the doors opened. Tell him that the offer has too many conditions attached, I said to the student who was holding up the phone, waving at me, trying to get me to come back. 
She was still trying to get my attention as the elevator doors closed on me for the last time. I sometimes wonder what would have happened if I'd taken the managing partner's call, out from under the horrible junior that ruined my articles, and the abusive partner who didn't give a crap. Maybe I would have blossomed. With a decent salary, proper secretarial support, maybe even some mentoring, things would have gone great so long as my uncle sent work to the firm. But without my uncle, I was nothing to the firm, a nobody. So did you get fired? Angela said when I met her for lunch. Yes, I said, because it was the easy thing to say, and strictly speaking, it wasn't a lie, because the partner had fired me at the start of the interview. It was years before I told Angela what actually happened. I'm sorry, Angela said. I'm not, I said. So, what are you going to do? I'll figure it out, I said, and in the end I did, more or less. But among the many, many bad memories I have of the firm where I articled, one of the worst is being so damaged by the end of the year that it was impossible for me to consider their offer. I simply had to turn it down. In comes my GF21 female. She is the best thing to happen to me and has helped me constantly through my worst and have always supported me and helped me. I have been with her since the end of high school, and somehow I'm still with her even though she is so amazing. But what happens when someone who likes to have control over everyone and everything has her son meet a GF? Insecurity and jealousy. Me and my GF have always had to take turnabout with my mom, so I would go to her house, then she would have to come to mine. However, if my mom had anxiety or felt lonely, she would ask my GF to come to mine or ask me to tell my GF. If I tried to say no, she would always go on and keep asking, bring stuff up to the point where it is just easier to say yes. Which is okay. I guess I understand she feels lonely and anxious sometimes. However, if me or my GF wanted to go to my GF's house more than once in a row, my mom would start having to go at me about it, how it's unfair and it's supposed to her turn to come here. Me or my GF never said anything about that. We never cared that much. We just want to see each other. I mainly wanted to go to my GF's as well, since my mom constantly asked me to do stuff to help out and just springs on me to go out and get stuff for her and my GF has to help to. However, when it came to me living between my sisters and grandpa's things changed. I didn't want to be at any of them since my papa's place was so small and uncomfortable, and my sisters I was only there at night and they went to bed early. So I wanted to go to hers and obviously she wanted that too. My mom didn't like this, though she constantly complained I would go there no matter how I tried explaining it. My mom would complain about living there every day, but if I said, well, I don't want to be here all the time since I don't like being here. She would not care since I was leaving and seeing my GF. So my mom took that as my GF forced me to run around for her to her place since my GF is rude and doesn't want to go to my grandpa's place. This led to one day after we got a new house to live at my GF started coming over again. Me and my GF were doing our own thing and had dinner plans booked and ready. However, my mom said, I'm going to make a roast tonight if we want to eat it too. And I said, well, we have dinner booked. My mom kept trying to argue back about it, even though we wanted to go out. And I said to tell my brother, who was at the shop getting the dinner, not to get too much since my mom was on the phone with him. So the night goes on and me and my GF start leaving for dinner where my mom goes. Where are you going? And I say we are going out for dinner like we had planned and booked. My mom still brought everything and cooked everything for a big roast, even after I said I would be out and everything. I said I told you, so I'm still going out, so she started getting mad. My mom ends up having to go at my GF and saying how I run around for my GF for those three months and how I'm running to my GF for dinner. While this goes on, I try stand up for my GF, but my mom just doesn't listen. So me and my GF just go out to dinner. My GF tells me she is uncomfortable coming to mine again and like all good since I don't want to be home most of the time anyway because my anxiety and sadness. A few days later, my mom messages my GF that only talks about how she maybe shouldn't have said what she said and that my GF should come over for me. My DF responds with how she doesn't feel respected, so she still doesn't want to come over, especially since mom didn't even apologize. This made my mom go off. She started talking to my family and some of my extended family, and they started saying mean things about my GF and insulting her in front of me and or my mom would say to me. Apparently, my GF thinks she above everyone since she just didn't want to get disrespected. So I got so sad, obviously, about it, and when I'm emotional, I get quiet. I don't want to speak to anyone. So my mom took that personally and started yelling at me for not talking and treating her like crap. So it made me feel worse about the situation. I couldn't tell my Jeff she got my family all involved at first since it was heartbreaking. But I eventually told her they said stuff about her, but not exactly what. Then my mom wanted to have my GF stop carrying this crap on. 
so my mom messaged my Jeff to have a fresh start for the new year and forget everything. My GF responded with how she doesn't want to be vulnerable to be treated like that again and have my family judge her while she is there. My mom took this personally. She yelled at me about it and how I need to control my 21-year-old little girl. She kept saying how my GF's response was even rude, yet when I asked, she couldn't explain it. And we argue, and I try to say, well, why would she feel comfortable with everything everyone said? But of course, through three days, or arguing my mother didn't listen to one thing I said. On the third day, though, my mom had one of my siblings or something hack into my messenger, which is the app I message my GF the most on, and they look through my private messages. With me approving of my GF's messages and calling her mad since I tell my GF how my mom has been treating me. I couldn't deal with it anymore. I started packing my bags and my mom started doing petty things in her anger. She came into my room for 10 seconds and I heard my keys to my car get moved when they were on top of my drawers. Later, I eventually found them under my bed somehow and she still lied saying she didn't touch them. Then she threatened to call the police if I took my car since when I got it, she said it will be better in her name since it will be cheaper. So I said fine and started grabbing my stuff from the car. So she decides to lock me in the garage and I have nothing and I'm in my PJs. So I start walking, even though it was the middle of the night before she stopped me as I was going down the street to come back in. She eventually calmed down and let me take my car to be safe, but she kept trying to convince me to stay, but I wasn't going to. So I left and I have been out of home for two and a half weeks. Luckily, I get to stay at my GF's grandparents' house and they've been incredibly nice to me. I'm desperately looking for a job as I only get one shift a week and a government payment every two weeks. I still talk to my mom, but never has been the same since. I feel so bad for my GF and my mind has been getting torn apart between everything, but it's getting better now. I feel this guilt like I betrayed my family because they all believe what my mom says, but I know my GF is just standing her ground, which I was too weak to do for so long, and so I got manipulated constantly. Man, you won't believe the crazy stuff that went down at the grocery store today. So picture this. I'm standing in line minding my own business, waiting to pay for my chips and soda. It's your typical Wednesday afternoon, you know, the kind where the air is hot and everyone just wants to get in and out. Now let me set the scene for you. In front of me is this sweet old guy, probably in his 80s, with a cane and a hat that screams I've been around the block. I respect my elders, so I'm cool with waiting. Behind me is a mom with a cart full of screaming kids, and beside her is this Karen, the queen of entitlement. I swear you could feel the negativity radiating off her. So, the old guy, let's call him Mr. Johnson, turns to Karen and politely asks her to respect the line. He's like, hey lady, we're all waiting here. No need to be pushy. And you won't believe what she does. She looks him dead in the eyes, smirks like she's the queen of the universe, and shoves him in the chest. Right there. I couldn't believe it. I thought, who raised this woman? Mr. Johnson stumbles back and the whole line goes silent. I'm not one for confrontation, but seeing an old man getting pushed around. That's where I draw the line. The mom behind me gasps, and even her kids shut up for a second. That's when our hero comes into the scene, Dave, the grocery store employee. Now Dave is this tall, lanky dude who's always chill. You can tell he doesn't want to deal with any drama, but he's the hero we didn't know we needed. Dave walks over, cool as a cucumber, and says, Hey, is there a problem here? Karen, of course, starts blabbering about how Mr. Johnson disrespected her and she had to defend herself. I'm rolling my eyes so hard. I'm surprised they didn't pop out of my head. But Dave, he's a genius. Instead of arguing, he just calmly says, okay, let's all take a step back and relax. We're not in a boxing ring here. I'm thinking, Dave, you legend. Mr. Johnson is trying to keep his cool, but you can see he's shaken. I'm ready to throw my bag of chips at Karen, but Dave gestures for everyone to calm down. He tells Karen that if she doesn't chill, he's going to have to ask her to leave. Karen, not one to be easily intimidated, rolls her eyes and crosses her arms like a toddler who didn't get their way. But Dave, man, he's got the patience of a saint. Meanwhile, the mom behind me is doing that thing where you try to comfort your kids without losing your mind. I give her a sympathetic smile, like, I can't believe we're dealing with this. Dave decides to take control of the situation. He tells Karen that she needs to either wait her turn like everyone else or leave the store. I'm silently cheering for Dave because let's be real, Karen needed a reality check. But Karen, oh no, she's not done. She goes off about how she's going to report this to corporate, get Dave fired, and sue the store for emotional distress. It's like she's reading from the entitled Karen handbook. Dave, unimpressed, tells her she's free to do whatever she wants. But right now she's holding up the line. That's when he drops the bomb. 
If she doesn't make a choice in the next 30 seconds, he's calling security. You should have seen the look on Karen's face. It was like someone deflated her ego balloon. She huffs, gives us all one last glare, and decides to storm out of the store. The mom behind me whispers, good riddance. With Karen gone, Dave turns to Mr. Johnson, who's still looking a bit shaky. He apologizes for the inconvenience, gives the man a discount on his groceries, and even helps him pack his bags. I'm thinking, Dave, you're the real MVP. The line starts moving again, and the tension lifts. The mom behind me thanks Dave, and I give him a nod of approval. As I'm leaving, I hear one of the cashiers saying, Man, the Dave guy deserves a raise. And you know what? I couldn't agree more. The hero we didn't know we needed saving the day at the local grocery store. Just another Wednesday in the life of a regular shopper. For context, there was no age limit at all for this concert, mainly because the concert had a theme that was aimed for all age ranges, video game concert. That's fine with me, especially because the game is not inherently inappropriate. It's like the EA rating of 10 at most. 10 still isn't that vulgar. Shared spaces between adults and kids exist, and I'm fine with that, until parents cut their kids slack simply because it's their kid. Like, seriously? Has parenting taken such a turn that parents don't step up and acknowledge the faultiness of their own parenting? Now I get that this interaction is honestly quite mundane, and I wouldn't care this much to rant about it if the mother had not reacted so poorly. I'm very polite with a lot of my public interactions, as most people should be. So the most I say is something along the lines of, excuse me, I can feel your son kicking my seat. I would prefer if he wouldn't. And to put it briefly, it was quite a blunt statement because I don't need to elaborate more than that. Even then, my tone of voice was calm. His mother proceeds to attack me for no reason. She basically gaslights me. Saying that this is life and you can tell my son what to do with his, I'd prefer if you didn't nitpick him. She basically mimicked my statement earlier about the preference thing and used it as a harsh statement towards me. Also, life is annoying to everyone. Why do you have to let your kid be a nuisance? This mother's logic was flawed. I think she saw this as an attack on her as a parent and her kid, which, to be fair, with how she reacted, might as well have been a personal attack on her because she didn't take it well at all. I feel to mature as a parent and a person, you take it objectively and say, okay, thanks, I'll keep that in mind or whatever the F along those lines. If that was my son, I tell him to stop kicking immediately and for God's sake's reason I didn't see, and a stranger told me I'd immediately take accountability for my own goddamn child. What's worse is she knows I was in the right, cuz, I heard her whisper to her kid to stop kicking afterwards. If you know what I'm saying is correct, why can't you just react like a normal person? Instead, she had to throw shade at me and act like a witch. Seriously, I think some people aren't fit to be parents. Enjoying the stories yet? If you do, please subscribe, like, and comment. For context, I started working at this uh, grocery store chain when I was 16 and transferred to another location at 21. This takes place Halloween of 2022. I had to work during the day shift and my store allows us to dress up so I wore my John Constantine costume, which I washed once I got home before meeting up with friends to hang out and have fun. We end up deciding to get some snacks and drinks and stop by the location of our store that was closest to the house we were hanging out at which happened to be the one I transferred from the year before. While my friends and I were talking about what we wanted to regular recognize me and asked if I knew where something was, so I told my friends I'll meet back up with them after I help the customer. I then proceeded to show her where the item was and asked if she needed anything else, and she said no, and asked me if I still worked there since she hadn't seen me in a while, and so I told her I had transferred the year before. This is where the Karen comes in. She sees me telling the previous lady to have a good day and doesn't say anything as I walk by to meet up with my friends. Next thing I know, while we're at the register checking out our order, I hear a feminine voice say, Excuse me, I've been following you around the entire store and you didn't even look at me. I apologize and ask if there was something I could help her with, and she then said that she wants me to find everything on her list and grab it for her. This is where I realized what was going on and explained I don't work at that location. And even if I did, that is not what the job entails. Her response was, If you don't work here, then why did you help that other lady? I replied by telling her that I had work at this location for a little over five years and transferred the year before, so I still knew the store pretty well. And this is when she starts screaming at me to get a manager, because she's going to get me fired, and my friends are telling me to ignore her, and let's go. I instead decide to piss her off and get the store manager who knew me since I worked there in the past, and the look on Karen's face when he said I didn't work there anymore, 
and even if I did, I was clearly off the clock, meaning I didn't need to help her if I didn't want to was priceless. After she left, I asked him if she's been an issue since I'd left, and he said she's been doing this every week for the past two months and the next time he will have her trespassed, because he's getting tired of dealing with her BS. My friends and I had a good laugh once we got into one of their trucks out of the house. Now, this isn't the first time this has happened to me. Hell, it's not even the first time I've posted about this. But seriously, why does it bother people so much when you heat a meal up in public? Long story short, I'm homeless. I don't drink or do drugs. I'm clean. I shower daily, etc. For the most part, you would have a difficult time telling I am homeless. But being homeless means limited options to cook and eat. You either find a way to cook or eat fast food, which is expensive. I can cook a cheap meal for a couple of dollars, but unfortunately, I can't always go back to camp, where I sleep, to cook a small meal. Yesterday, I spent most of the day at the library sending out resumes. I hadn't eaten all day, so I decided to grab a can of beans from my backpack and my hobo stove. I found a spot not too far from the library, city property with a walking trail, a large field, and those large electricity steel wire tower things. Fast food is expensive, so I avoid it at all costs. A cheap meal at a fast. Food place costs $10. With some planning, that $10 can easily get me two days' worth of food. When I'm out like that, I have a small camping pot and some sort of heat to cook. I picked up a small business stove from the thrift store, and you can get the canisters fairly cheap at the dollar store. I typically set up on a picnic table, and the entire meal takes less than 10 minutes to heat. But for some reason, whenever there's fire, the one Karen of the area has to see it and come running to cause me problems. I set up with my chili in my pot, my fire going, and like a crappy video game, a male Karen spawned in, walking his Frenchie. He saw me doing my thing, and I guess the hobo just making his meal offended his delicate senses because he came over in a hurry. He was not there to be a decent person. He came to witch at me. The man saw me cooking and was immediately aggressive. He yelled at me, what are you doing? He said, I can't do that here. It's unsafe, against the law, and told me I have to go. I've been through this more than once, so I'm now an old school veteran. I just replied with dead eyes and said, okay, I'm going to leave once I eat. Have a nice day. That pissed him off. The man was almost jumping up and down like a child having a temper tantrum, telling me that it's illegal to have a fire. It's contained on a portable stove. He said he's going to call the police, and I said good luck with that and gave him a double thumbs up. The guy got on his phone, made a call, and walked away talking loudly with the police. I fully believe he just faked a call and talked to air just trying to scare me. As I said, I've been through this multiple times. My food got hot. I ate, cleaned up, packed my stuff away, and went on with my day. That man did absolutely nothing to slow me down. It was barely an inconvenience. My food wasn't even hot by the time he left. If you're a Karen and see someone like me, hurting not one, just trying to cook a meal, kindly F off, leave me alone. Let me go about my business. This happened on Sunday afternoon. It was Remembrance Sunday. Everyone was gathered at the Kenotaph in Westminster to pay their respects to those who gave their lives in service of their country. Me and my dad were standing in the crowd. We were both wearing dark suits. My dad had his war medals pinned to his chest. I had my granddad's Victoria Cross medal in my pocket as I wanted to have a part of him with us while we paid our respects. After what was a very emotional ceremony for my dad, who had reconnected with some old soldier friends, we headed to Starbucks for some lunch. We arrived and noticed that there was a long table at the end that was occupied by current members and veterans of all the different armed forces. We placed our order for two coffees and two sandwiches and a slice of cake. It came to Pstine.95. As I was opening up Apple Pay on my phone, the barista noticed my police warrant card hanging from my suit pocket and my dad's medals. He smiled at us. Barista, that will be exactly zero pounds. It's on the house for both of you. It will be ready shortly. We thanked him and moved to the end of the counter to wait for our lunch. My dad starts talking to some other veterans when I see a man, probably in his late 30s, shouting at the barista. A little girl is behind him sobbing. He's being so loud everyone can hear exactly what he's saying. A.D. What do you mean I have to pay? You gave those two their food for free. You did the same for that group before them. I need it for free. What makes them so special? My daughter is hungry and I've left my wallet in my car. Barista. If you're a member of the Armed Forces or Emergency Services, then I can give it to you for free today. But I need to see an ID. AD. Yeah, of course I'm a soldier. 
I'm in the army. Now, can I have my food? Barista. Really, what regiment? Where's your Mod 90 or veterans card? For those who don't know, Mod 90 is UK military ID. AD. Um, my what? Barista. If you're a soldier, then you'd know instantly what that is, and you should also have it on you at all times. Also, your haircut is totally not following the regulation. Finally, no one as fat as you would be allowed to join the army. You wouldn't last one day at training. You'd bust a gut just walking up the stairs. E.D., how dare you? You don't know anything about being a soldier. I want to see your manager. Now? Barista. I'm an army reservist. Here's my ID. I think I know exactly what I'm talking about. He pulls out his ID from his wallet and holds it up before putting it back. Now to pay? Will that be card, cash, or Starbucks card? E.D. goes really pale and looks embarrassed. He dragged his daughter out without saying another word. I lean over the counter and extend my hand to Barista and shake. Me. Mate, that was epic. You totally own that jerk. Good job. Barista. Yeah, it just makes me angry that people actually stoop to that level. He deserves to go to hell. We continued to have a chat until another customer walked in the door. Me and my dad collected our food and sat down at a table eating our lunch. Thanks for joining us. If you enjoyed the video, don't forget to hit the like button and subscribe for more captivating stories. Share your own experiences, opinions in the comments below, and let's keep the conversation going. Until next time, stay tuned for more epic tales.